Good morning. Might be a little bit cold outside and it might be in the weather reports that it's going to get colder, but we still can try to maintain some warmth in our hearts. We are on a series uh, entitled Order My Steps, Order My Steps. And a lot of times we live our lives without much spiritual guidance at all. And so this month, the beginning of this new year, calling people to think about what does it mean to say, hey, God, what should I do? Order my steps. Give me some sense of direction. Uh, on the second Sunday, we're looking at first steps. So I started watching this series called Babies, and I really like looking at babies. It's a Netflix documentary, but I looked at one part, and it's called actually First Steps. So hence, uh, that's what drew me a little bit to this episode. But in it, there's a professor, a doctor from the Department of Human Movement Sciences, Dr. Nadia Dominici. I hope I'm saying her name right. And she looks at little infants and toddlers and walking. And so she started doing research around walking. And what she has observed so far is that the muscular activity of a baby is the same as the muscular activity of a toddler. So she's wondering over time, will toddlers keep the same muscular activity and actually maybe like animals walk sooner? She's encouraging people to encourage their babies to walk. And so uh, the only difference that she notes between a baby and a toddler is that the toddler has the touchdown of feet. When the toddler puts its foot down, it has a connection with the ground and the ability for the toddler to push off. I found this interesting. You know, there are certain milestones in a baby's life that parents look forward to. They anticipate, they don't wanna miss out on. They'll say to the other parent, if there are two parents, record it. And so they look at pleasure and with pleasure at their baby's movements, being able to hold their head up, being able to crawl, even being able to hop, and sometimes even using furniture to be able to stand up. And then one day it happens for the baby and the baby makes that connection. And there's one step and then there's a second step. And then what happens usually? The baby plops, falls down. But oh, the joy that comes from parents watching their baby's development. First steps can be shaky, but first steps lead to second steps, and second steps lead to third steps, and so on and so on. And the more steps, the more coordinated and confident the baby becomes. But the journey begins with that first step. This is where we enter the biblical text today. There is a movement going on and people are responding to the coming of Jesus by believing and by getting baptized. Baptism historically was the first step in a committed life to Jesus. You feel the pull of the message and then what? You get baptized. The symbolism surrounding this ritual is all about retiring from one's old life and taking on a new life, a new form, commitment to God. One is being dipped into water and washing off of perhaps this old way of living. In the text today, loads of people are taking this first step. John is encouraging them to take the first step towards a spiritual journey that will change their lives forever. Even Jesus takes this first step and Jesus gets baptized, which makes it all the more enduring. The hope in taking these first steps is that our subsequent steps will be ordered by God. Our church is also taking some first steps. Last year, there were a series of first steps. We began the process of becoming an officially welcoming space for the LGBTQ community. That may not seem like a big deal to everybody, but we will vote this month on being a safe space for a whole group of marginalized people. Here is why I think it matters. I've begun some conversations on Facebook with people asking them why they come to church or why they don't. And I remember two responses, but one that pierced my heart. And this lady said, I went to church all the way up until my daughter came out. 
And then when my daughter came out, the church told us we were going to hell, and that ended my days in the church. So I think what we're doing here is a first step, and it's an important step that we say here at our church is a safe space for people who are different, for people who are on the margins. We say that God loves everybody. We are doing other first steps, but I think even more so, we will need to take first steps. Intellectually, I think we know this, but sometimes when it calls for us to do things different, it is hard. Many churches keep doing the same thing and they wanna get different results. I think there's more emphasis for us this year on putting youth in the forefront. I've been pushing it and I've been speaking it in my sermons and saying we have to do something for our young people. Look around in our church lately and we are greatly missing people who are under 40 years old. We see some on social media, but as far as a deeper commitment, we don't have that many people really under 40 that are coming to our church. Our focus has to be intentional. Things don't just happen. We have to be intentional about how do we reach that audience? What are the changes we need to do? Are there some first steps that we need to make? How do we do church differently? We need our steps to be ordered by God. We send you guys off every Sunday into the world to have your steps ordered by God Monday through Saturday, and that's critical. There's this story I watched years ago, Then She Found Me, came out in 2007, and it went something like this in the story. There was this story that got told, and it was pitched as a Jewish story, an ordinary Jewish joke. I want you to listen to it. A father was teaching his son to be less afraid. Parents have an interesting way of teaching their kids certain things, but this father wanted to teach his son to have more courage, and so he had his son jump down the first set of steps. Jump, he said to his son, and I'll catch you. And then his son jumped, and he caught him. The little boy was afraid, but he trusted his father each time, and each time his father moved down the step one more time and said, jump, I will catch you. It was only when the sun was very high and the father was very low, the father told the son to jump. And when the son jumped, the father stepped back and the son fell. And the boy fell flat on his face and he picked himself up bleeding and crying. And the father said to him, that'll teach you. I was actually horrified by this story when I saw it like, well, this is not a good Jewish. <laughs> So I called up my Jewish rabbi friend and was like, you know, you got to tell me more about this. And they were like, I haven't heard that story neither, Charlene. I was like, well, then she found me is playing it. And they're saying it's a Jewish folklore. I share that story to say that we are progressive Christians and that's not our message, but that's what some church teaches, that somehow God is angry with us and God punishes us. And so when we see things like COVID, et cetera, it is God. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off. That'll teach you. Our narrative is less known, and we have to be bold in taking first steps to say our message. We have to say and show and put up our symbols that we understand Christianity different, that we understand God is a God of love and a God of inclusion. And we have to be loud and as vocal as the other guys. We have to take some first steps because first steps matter. It's a new year, and this is just the second Sunday, but we were here just seems a minute ago, and so these weeks pass by pretty clearly. What first steps might you want to take this year? Don't look around at others. Don't think about what somebody else in your house needs to do or down the street, but just sit with that question. What might God want to do with me this year? What steps might God want me to take away from something or to something? First steps away or steps toward? If fear was not a problem or a factor, what steps might I be able to take? If being uncomfortable were not a factor, what steps might I be able to take? Lord, order my steps. A couple of weeks ago, one of my mentors, Dr. E.C. Reams, died at 92 years old. When she was young, she felt called to ministry 
But her church said that God did not ordain pastors, did, did not ordain females. And so she sat struggling because she felt called by God, and yet her church and the community she grew up in felt like she was not called, and it was no way that she could have heard from God. And then she decided to do something different. I want to read an excerpt written from one of her mentors, Dr. Claudette Copeland. I had the best natural mother. She, Juanita, taught me all I needed to know about life and living. I had the best grandmother. But who knew I needed a mother in ministry for where God was taking me? Dr. E.C. Reams was that for me. Today my heart is heavy. For this, my mother has fallen asleep. She did not handle me with fragility, but I did not run or shrink in offense. Her corrections were unedited, yet her vision for our future was clear and wide and beautiful. Some joined her ministry and will give her no credit, but I do. And I give great thanks for the way I benefited from her suffering and her hard-won platform. She preached from the back of a flatbed truck with a loud speaker because nobody would have her in her church. She endured the slights and humiliations of the era that came her way by licking her wounds and keep on going. And in churches far away, her presence awakes something in a generation of young black sisters who were being told they were not called. She erected scaffolds that few of us in this branch of Zion have ever seen a woman do. She created transitional housing in Oakland for sex workers to get them off the streets. She opened a feeding program. She opened an elementary school. She constructed a church, and she allowed the light meant for her to shine on us young women. I think of E.C. Reams because I did go to her ministry, and I did see her bless and affirm sisters. And I thank God for her, and I thank God for people who are willing to take the first steps that pave the way and open the door for us. Can we be that for somebody else? As God's feet and God's hand and God's heart here on earth, often our steps can make a big difference. We underestimate how much impact we can have on our world. But we have to be open and willing and uncomfortable. We have to be willing to travel a different path, even if the GPS says this is quicker. We have to be willing to get folks mad at us sometimes. We have to be willing to do something different willing to shine our light in the world. We have to be willing to speak to those who sit on our steps. We have to be willing to really embrace change, not just intellectually. We have to be willing to say, not my will, but God's will. Willing to give up some of our privilege so that we can empower and help others. Willing not to be so selfish. It doesn't always have to be about us willing to go where God instructs us to go. And truth be told, many of us are not all that willing, not willing to let God be in charge, for God to guide us, for God to have God's hand on the wheel. We still need Sunday school teachers, and I've been asking for month, first steps. We still need more volunteers, first steps. We need more greeters, first steps. We need landscapers and artists, first steps. We need young people, first steps. We need to engage our community and not just walk out the church and get in our cars and go home, first steps. We need to speak to the stranger, first steps. And like a toddler, our first steps might be shaky. We might be uncertain. We might plop, we might fall to the ground. But the key difference is your feet got to touch the ground, and you got to thrust forward. And if we are ordered by God, we cannot fail. I read this touching story around six years ago, and maybe some of you heard it. It was in the news outlet. Grandma Wanda sent a text to her grandson. Instead of, a, instead of it going to her grandson, it actually went to Jamal. Jamal, who lived about 45 minutes away, got the text. And when Jamal got the text, he wrote back to Grandma Wanda, who is this? And Grandma Wanda said, I'm your grandma. <laughs> now, they quickly discovered that she had texted the wrong person. 
And this is where things should have ended because we've all received a wrong call. We've made a wrong call, right? And you say, I'm sorry, sorry, got the wrong person. But Jamal responds, you're not my grandma, but can I still come to Thanksgiving? Now, Wanda could have ended it because Wanda don't know who Jamal is at all. She just knows she was trying to write her grandson. And she says, of course you can, because that's what grandmas do. Grandmas feed people. Now, Jamal, I already told you, lived 45 minutes away, but Jamal got in his car, and on that Thanksgiving, he drove to Grandma Wanda's house, and she invited him in, and he had Thanksgiving with her family. That was six years ago, and every Thanksgiving, Jamal and his girlfriend go to Grandma Wanda's house. Well, Netflix got a hold of this story, and I hear it's making it a movie. Because Grandma Wanda and Jamal continued to talk, and he shared about his girlfriend, and they began to develop a relationship. And this is what they have to say to the rest of the world. We are excited to share our story with the world. We hope it inspires more people to reach out and make connections that they wouldn't ordinarily make. I call it first steps. Wanda and Jamal said in a joint statement, we are so blessed to find a genuine friendship brought together by God from a mistaken text message. First steps. Let us take first steps towards the stranger. Let our feet by, be guided by God. And let us see wrong turns and wrong numbers as the opportunity that they are. The world and people in it are waiting for us to be the light. Let's really seek God and ask God, what do you want me to do next? Where do you want me to go, God? And if we are totally lost as to what to do, Maybe we should try texting the wrong number. The world needs us. The world needs our radiant light, our abundant grace of second and third and fourth chances, and our message of radical inclusivity, because we are Christians. And like Grandma Wanda said, that's what Christians do. We feed people. We extend grace. We shine the light on the good news. We invite people in. And all we need to do, according to the researchers, are let our feet touch the ground and then push off. Amen.